We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was exciting. That was Australia. That was Australia. <laughs> the, the chaos we expected, they delivered. They did. The... I don't want to say thunder from down under, but like the insanity down under something. I'll come something, up with a catchy something. thing eventually. But um, holy hell, man, what a race. Yeah, that that was a race. And, you know, what was interesting to me is like some people's reactions were like, that was like kind of boring. I'm like, where? I'm sorry, but that is every Ferrari fan's dream race. <laughs> so... But also, like, every Ferrari fan is going to be on the edge of their seats until the race ends because, you know, that there's always a high risk of Ferrari doing a Ferrari strategy moment. Oh, I know. I mean, we were in, what, lap 54, 55. I'm like, Catherine, my anxiety is still super high. Like, I'm still really nervous. I don't want to watch. Yeah, um, but it also didn't help that Carlos comes on the radio in, like, what, lap 56 and says, oh my, my God, tires are like, going. My tires are gone. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, you have two laps, sir. <laughs> Don't pull a George Russell. But then George. We'll get to George, George later. Russell, so. <laughs> yeah, we, no, we will think, discuss all of that. I think it was a solid race. We had some solid fighting, some solid racing. It was exactly what we would have expected to see in Australia. Some DNFs, some people not even starting. You know, there's always chaos. I love it. Yeah, wow. mass, mass chaos. And, you know, and, and speaking of, of DNFs, there were three. Uh, one of them was, of course, Max Verstappen on lap three, because his, basically, he was driving with the parking brake uh, from the start. And, you know, whoopsie doops. Oopsies. Yeah. No, Though the pictures think... of, of that, the whole wheel and then, like, the, the tire that I saw on, on social media, that was gnarly. Yeah, watching the, the slow-mo replay of, like, the fire and the flames are just, like, yeah i was like that's terrifying and max is like yeah. there's fire <laughs> and i'm like then why are you driving yeah but speaking of why are you driving i thought it was really interesting that max didn't pull off and was able to get the car back into the pits yeah um because i think that everyone else would have loved and appreciated him a if he had car. stopped on track to, to cause a safety car or a vsc and everyone's like oh god damn he, he he made it into the, the pit to, to retire well, but it, I mean, he was pretty close to the pit. The one, so another DNF was Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. Um, and I was surprised that he was able to like pull off and find a, a good location for his car to be taken off. So there wasn't yeah. a safety car. Cause I think Hamilton. Well, there was that. a VSC for Lewis. Right. right, right. It was so short. There, was a vir- there was a virtual safety car, but like under a normal safety car, it would have been completely different. Right. Than a virtual safety car. And I think him doing that really saved Carlos. Oh, yeah, 100%. I it would have been like, a different race. It would have been a completely different race. They would have had to, you know, they, they were already on plan B strategy-wise by the time, you know, lap 17 rolled around. They were um, on plan A up until, like, lap 15, and then all of a sudden they went plan B. Oops, plan B. Yeah, so Max did not match his, um, you know, F1 leading consecutive win streak. Could he probably get to ten consecutive wins again this season? Yeah, probably. We will probably because we see still it. have what twenty races left. <laughs> we we've got plenty of time if you're a Red Bull fan and you're worried. Um, and I also think that from like the Red Bull camp, obviously there's a lot of like media presentation in the way they talk about things. But I, I, you know, the fact that this was their first DNF in two years, you know, it's not like nope, the nope. car let's, is unreliable. Let's let's pause. It is Max's first DNF. In two years. That is not correct. Yes. Do not forget the double DNF from Checo last year. That, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that is, that is correct. Um, but, you know, we, we shall, we shall see how things go. But, you know, if you're a Red Bull fan, don't be worried. No, it's, it's nothing to be worried about. I mean, Max will still be world champion. Red Bull will still win. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah, pretty much. Rinse and repeat. Yeah. But, okay, but enough about Red Bull and Max. Like, the sad thing is I think Max DNFing is the only way anyone is going to be able to win unless it's a, it's a you know, really tight circuit, hard to pass. And Singapore. Max does really bad in qualifying. So, yeah, 
Singapore. Basically Singapore. <laughs> I was trying to beat around the bush a little bit there. But yeah, so basically Singapore, if he doesn't qualify well, that's another opportunity. But if he's not DNFing, I don't think anyone else is going to be able to pass him. I just don't. He's driving so well, and he's driving so well in that car. So. Yeah, it it you know the Carlos even overtaking Max just felt so uncharacteristic until you realize after the fact that oh I knew something was wrong that something was, like, was wrong with the car <laughs> I was like, yeah I was like he just passed him uh, what's how going on? why <laughs> what's, yeah what's going on what's wrong and and you can even see like he was slowing down and yeah so it's unfortunate but unless other teams bring insane upgrades that just blow everything out of the water and Red Bull doesn't improve at all. Or maybe they go Which backwards, they but yeah, exactly. So I think it's, I just think they really figured out these regulations and they're doing a really good job and you can't fault them for that. Like I'm saying that as a Ferrari fan. Um, yeah. But now let's talk really about the, the part of Ferrari that we're all really excited about. And even me as a not Ferrari fan, I'm, I'm excited sorry. about. We're talking Team Carlos. <laughs> the the Team, Team Carlos Ferrari. part of Ferrari. Yeah, that is, that is correct. We are all aboard the Team Carlos train. Holy hell, what a weekend this man had. What a, last what a 16 weeks. days. <laughs> I know. Uh, so, I mean, unless you live under a rock like Patrick Starr, um, Carlos had his appendix out and he did not race in the last race. Ollie Behrman took over his spot because he had to have emergency surgery for uh, removal of his appendix. And then he's like, oh, yeah, I'm targeting Australia. I'd like to race, but like. I'm not an idiot. If I don't feel well, I won't race. And then all weekend, he's like, yeah, I'm not feeling comfortable. I don't feel great, but here I am. And then he wins. Yeah. Who does that? Yeah. But, like, look at him getting out of the car after I the know. race. He, like, limped out of the car in the car. Yeah, he, he's like, I'm going like, to sit Ooh. on the halo and yeah. move my feet. Yeah, he, he was definitely, be, you know, there, there was a lot of, of care being taken to not aggravate everything. And as, as somebody who knows, abdominal surgery is no joke. No, I mean, I've never had it, but it looks terrible. And like, oh my God, I can't believe, like, whenever I had surgery, I was out for the count for like a month, maybe more. Granted, yeah. it was back surgery, so it's a little different. But surgery is surgery. It's, it's a lot. out of your body. It's a lot. And this kid is like pulling five G's just casually and just yeah. going for it. I'm so impressed. Um, he is driving for a top team seat next year. And it's oh, so 100%. evident. He's also driving to just like big F you to Ferrari, which I'm also loving currently. Yeah. And I know we've talked about this a little bit in our DMs, but um, I really hope this whole Lewis Ferrari experiment like backfires and they're like, oh, we wish we still had Carlos, mm. but. We'll see but it, yeah. it, it also it was his third win which is really exciting so he yeah. won he had silverstone in 2022 um singapore last year australia this year he's only what seven points behind charles in this in the driver's standings and he sat out a race like yeah, he, he hopped he hopped to two places. Um, and then of it. of course the the funny part to this is he you know he's had a win in each of the last three seasons and George has crashed in every single race. I know. They just, you know, they feed off of each other. Clearly. Um and also the the funny thing um about um Carlos at the end um when he got out of the car is he threw his gloves into the crowd oh my god I know but and then he got yelled at like you saw him on on tv get to be you know weighed. admonished because when after a race you have to get weighed with everything your gloves your helmet your, your your shoes so the fact that he's like I don't care and then you kind of see him as he's walking to get weighed somebody hands him a pair of gloves that is totally not the original pair that he wore but and no I don't think anybody's going to complain about that no I um I'm glad that people actually celebrated him this time because like last time he was on the podium it was just like oh my team's not here they don't care oh yeah yeah, you're right yeah so now they're actually you know like ah yes Carlos yes Carlos who was going to be one of the best chances for them to see success this season you know Charles will do what Charles does but also like Carlos being like, hey, Charles, like, get up here. Let's celebrate together. Like, this is a really big thing. Like, Carlos is still 100% Team Ferrari, team, team mentality. Let's yeah. kill it in the constructors, even though you guys screwed me. Um, I don't know. I think he's just, this is his year. It's the year of Carlos. 
Yeah, he was, he was a real class act with with all of it. Okay. Um, and that leads to, you know, Carlos, you know, was saying after the race, you know, I, you know, I don't have a job next year. I hope this helps. Right, um, yeah. And it definitely has helped. Um, he is now on Red Bull's radar for 2025. Honestly, I think he's been on Red Bull's radar forever, though, because he was formerly with the Red Bull right. family. And I think Red Bull really likes to keep things in the family and keep everything close to the chest so I think yeah regardless of him winning in Australia or not I think Red Bull would still at least throw the name into the ring it could be a really hard and fast no but he would still be brought up just because he's from that original you know Red Bull family yeah and I think it would be enticing to him because yeah he you know had a good you know he had a good time at um Toro Rosso before he moved on I think to um I think he was at Force India right after um but I I think that you know Red Red Bull is a completely different animal than the B team so you know it could be something that he's open to um and I also think that unless Daniel you know poor Daniel gets his shit together and starts performing a little better um the guy who's probably going to be most screwed over out of this whole situation could be Liam Lawson um because he's the the one who should have a seat at RB that isn't there yet and you know depending on how things go it might push him back another year if Carlos is thrown into the mix yes and no I want to say though like if I could see, this is totally out of left field, I could see, and this is going to play into, you know, more of our silly season, all season madness, but I could see, hang on here, if Alonzo leaves, I could see Liam Lawson going to Aston Martin. Oh, interesting. I don't know why, but I just, I can see it. Okay. I mean, I, I'm not mad about it. It would give Lance Stroll an opportunity to be the number one driver, Mm -hmm. but Aston Martin has seen that he has proven experience in the car and it's not a Nick DeVries situation. Um, so, so yeah, I, I can, I I can totally see that. He's better and he has more experience than like a rookie coming into Williams. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. I think him going to like, I think Yuki is just getting, I think Yuki's going to be the one that's the most screwed because he's going to be stuck at V Carb his whole career and not be able to move up into a better car. Like that Honda money's tying him there, which is great. He'll probably yeah. always have a seat, but he's not going to have the best car. And I think Liam, if he has the opportunity to jump to a team where he has a better car, I think he would do that. I don't know that- why he wouldn't. Well, it, exactly. I mean, there, you know, obviously he would love to stay in the Red Bull family, but if Aston Martin comes calling, then, yeah. you know, what's he going to say? No, he wants to be on the Formula One grid, you right. know, as badly as anybody does. So I, I think that, you know, Carlos winning this race and, and Carlos doing what he has done and will continue to do is going to make Silly Season extremely interesting once we get to the summer portion of this yeah, and I think, honestly, Carlos would be a really good teammate with Max. I think he'd really push Max, because currently Checo's not pushing Max. I know Max yeah. needs to be pushed. However, I think they would really feed off of each other and work together well. I know that they're, you know, friendly at least. And, and they I already have worked be, together. They were teammates right. at Toro Rock as well. Yeah, and I, I think it would be good for both of them. And I think, again, it's not just because I'm not Checo's number one fan, but Checo's not doing a lot to help himself and I think if you put Carlos in that car he's gonna be posting times a lot closer to Max than Checo would be yeah you know his performance this weekend in the Ferrari has really you know gone to you know make me question what would it be like if he's in a Red Bull car right exactly so that could be really interesting yeah oh so another tangent about silly season in what March Go team. Yep, it's it's still March. Um, speaking Back on of track for Australia. Ferrari <laughs> and Australia and Ferrari, yeah. um, Charles Leclerc P two. Yeah, I mean, again, solid performance. It was fine. Like, well, okay, Ferrari didn't completely, you know, screw him over. Almost he, did. Almost not completely. He qualified decently. He he held his position. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think it was, was it life-changing? No, but he did what he needed to do. And I'm just so glad that Ferrari did not tell them to switch cars or switch positions or screw Carlos over. Because I, yeah. as, as soon as I saw one, too, I was like, oh, well, 
Charles is going to win because Ferrari is going to make the team call. But I'm so glad they didn't do that. And I'm so glad that you could see, like, those two cars right next to each other. And you could see Carlos had more pace. He was the stronger driver. Oh, yeah, so I, I, I really, I don't think they would have called for team orders. I think it's too early in the season to, to call for the flip. For Ferrari's case, we'll get to McLaren in a minute. Um, but I... You know, I, I was a little worried that they were going to kind of mess around on strategy. You know, we, we've seen times in the past where Red Bull has like undercut Perez in favor of Max. Um, but Ferrari really, really kept it clean for once, except when they dumped Leclerc out after a yeah. pit stop right in front of Perez and Alonso, um, which got a little dicey for a minute. Yeah, but I think they did that to help Carlos in the end they oh yeah they absolutely did it's just like they by them doing that i saw that they were prioritizing carlos 100 percent. were they kind of screwing charles yes Mm -hmm. but not they weren't at that point it was all team orders so like i understand it yeah it it worked out i think that timing wise it could have been a tiny bit better so that that he wasn't as much at risk of being in front of that fight um obviously they were both you know those other drivers were both on older tires so he had a bit of an advantage but it also does take a little bit of time to warm up those hards and on that track and so that could have gone really badly no 100 percent, it could have but I think pitting is just honestly such a crapshoot. I know they have strategists and everything like, oh, this is going to work. But there's so many variables in an F1 race where you're just hoping for the best with when you pit. I truly, oh, 100%. truly, deep down in my heart of hearts, that is my forever will be my stance on pitting. Yeah, it, it could go really well or it could you, you could win a world record or you could be, be there sour. For your- <laughs> to say be there for 52 52 seconds but sauber is a better way to uh, to put it so. sorry sauber mechanics we know it's not you oh god yeah well who knows yeah okay speaking moving, of setting records i'm gonna say moving to p3 on the podium Lando. yeah on the podium not winning no, he has officially set the Formula One record for most podiums without a win. This is his 14th. Um, oh, no. Yeah, he, he he broke that record. But, you know, I think he was happy that his his bestie um, won the race after, yeah. you know, freaking appendicitis. They, they, you know, the every, every time we get a, a moment of Carlos and Lando just, you know, being best friends, it's very nice to, to still be able to see that. I do um, miss them as teammates. I will say that. Yeah, that's, that's true. But the real question here is because at the beginning of the race, McLaren did a little bit of of team orders to put Lando ahead of Oscar. Um, Was that the right call? I think so. Just because the, what I was seeing coming over the radio from Piastri and his tire tag was worse than Lando's. I think they knew his car was set up a little bit differently or whatever and it, or mm-hmm. he just wasn't managing his tires well enough whatever the circumstances i think they did the best for the team performance i i agree and even if oscar did get on the podium i still wouldn't have gotten the points because the rest of our podiums were completely torpedoed by the Max's DNF. Um, But yeah, I know that a lot of people weren't happy about it because, you know, obviously it was Oscar's home race. It would have been great to see an Australian on on the podium, but Lando was just running better. Right. At the end of the day, this is a high performance sport with professional athletes trying to score points for a team. Yeah. Don't care what city we're in. Don't care whose home race it is. It, whose home race it is that's not how professional sports teams operate right and it's for the better of the team and this is the call they had to make like I don't I mean yes obviously it would have been great if, for him to be on the podium in Australia but like that's not how this works this yeah I mean one. yes yes we've seen moments where 
Lando has outperformed Oscar. We've seen moments where Oscar has outperformed Lando between last year. And yes, the season is only three races long, um, but we've seen a little bit of both from both drivers. I think right now McLaren is focusing on the opportunity. They had the best opportunity to have the most success in P3 and P4. Yep. Um, and they, I think, are ahead of schedule for where they expected to be by the time we got to Australia based on oh, kind of the things that they were saying, you know, in test and leading into the opening races of the season. I well, know we're still yes. in the opening races, but yes. I'm going to say yes and no. Like, what people say before the season starts, yeah, a thousand grains of salt. Like, give me a ton right. of salt and then I'll believe you. But I think a little bit of what people say preseason has some truth to it. Do I think they, you know, they were thinking they would be in P3 of the Constructors after Australia, probably not considering no. how their first three races went last year. Um, but they've definitely made strides since last year. I, I mean, we've both said we want Lando to win a race this year. Obviously, I think, unfortunately, his record is just going to keep increasing. Um, yeah. But he's getting points. He's scoring points. And you can't be upset about that when you have Ferrari and you have Red Bull. Yeah, it's... Driving. It's so hard to get your car if you're not a Red Bull or a McLaren into those podium positions into that top four. So the fact that both McLarens were able to do that, that's, you know, I know that everybody wanted to see Oscar, you know, have a great race. Oscar had a great race. He finished off the podium. That's not the best part of it, but it was still a great race. And McLaren definitely made the right decision. Exactly. 100%. Yeah. Speaking of decisions. Yeah. Williams. Yeah. So lots of noise coming out of Williams this weekend. So in much. Alex Albon totaled his car, essentially. Um, like, I'd say half a million dollars worth of damage and having to get it back to their factory. Um, destroyed the chassis. They didn't have a spare. They are extremely behind in their plan and everything. Um, coming off of the winter break. So they did not have a spare in Australia. James Wells has already come out and said, like, it's so unacceptable. We shouldn't be here. Like, we're a F1 team and we don't have an extra chassis. Like, this is deplorable, basically. Yeah. Um, But I know that they are working on changing things. So what they did is they took Logan out of his car and gave it to Alex for him to race because they decided as a team that's where they had the better opportunity to score points. Right. Lots of drivers, including Max, have spoken on this. And he said, you know, I'd be pissed. I would have flown home. I also would have wrecked my car so no one could race in it. I loved his statement. I, I loved it, too. I, You know, Max is growing on me, I have to say. Like, I, I can't get behind Checo, but Max is really growing on me. Yeah. Um, with his, like, I hate everybody attitude. Huge fan. Right. Um, Why do you think I like him so much? Know, that's, ex- that's exactly it. <laughs> Um, but do you think, Catherine, this was the right call for Williams? I mean, you have to look at, I mean, yes. The The, the answer is, is unfortunately yes. Does it like look good, you know, on paper? No. PR wise? No. But Al- Alex Albon scored 27 of Williams' 28 points last year. Um, and not to, you know, be against Logan, but Logan inherited the P10 when he did score points. He didn't, you know, he and didn't get it on, did on he... like real merit. And, no, you know, and he had a bunch of DNFs crash last year. Yeah. The, not, not as, as egregiously many as say like a Nicholas Latifi or a Nikita Mazepin, but still a lot more, more than, than expected. And Alex Albon, his best finish so far was where Alex finished in this race, which was right. P11. Was it unfortunate and still doesn't look great because Alex didn't end up scoring a point despite basically every driver on the grid's best efforts? Um, no, but was it the right call? I do think so. Yes. No, I'm I'm in 100% agreement with you. I mean, if you look where Logan's finished historically, it's mm-hmm. he didn't finish or he's P15 below. You know what I mean? Like, there's not a lot of times when he's actually fighting for points. Right. If Albon DNF or Albon got, like, P16, I would question it, but he was fighting for a point in P11. Yeah, he was he was fighting for a point the entire race and you know, he 
did exactly what was expected of him. It just, unfortunately, it was P12, or he wasn't P12, it was P11. Um, but he he did what Logan probably wouldn't have done. Yeah. And that's just, that that is an understanding that Williams has as a team that is in a really uncomfortable position to have to make that type of choice and is at risk of making these these choices again because they don't have backups right no so they so they sent alex's car back to the uk for repairs on australian saturday american friday um and it will be sent to japan to meet the team once they all make it there in two weeks but they're not going to have a third bucket um for japan they're not going to have a third one for china and the biggest risk for china is china is the first sprint race. race of the air sprint or race, sprint race. And, not straight race. yeah Sorry. yeah drill. <laughs> i meant to say sprint race so, so I heard them say that this weekend, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, oh no, crap. the first one of the year." Yeah, and you you know how much we do not love sprint races, and you will hear as we go throughout the season. But we're not there yet. We have to go to Suzuka first. I'm really excited to see what Suzuka le- looks like in the spring for for racing. But I'm um, just gonna say this: yeah. we may not even have a sprint race in China. I'm still not convinced <laughs> we're racing in China. This is. This is Las Vegas 2023 all over again. Right? Like, that that's a real question. So Williams is still at risk of super duper having to make awkward calls until we are through this, you know, East Asian point yeah. of, of the schedule. Um, but, you know, Logan has been a class act about this. Obviously, no one wants to, like, you know, Carlos couldn't race because he had to go to the hospital. Logan couldn't race because his teammate needed his car on his 28th birthday. What a present. Um, But Logan has handled it really well. Obviously, you know, Logan knows the kind of position that he's in as the, you know, the Williams driver who is learning, you know, hopefully not still learning the car, but is, is, you know, has, has made a jump from the lower series to F1. Um, and obviously he's not a rookie anymore, but still he's the, you know, rookiest guy on the grid. Yeah. I mean, the big question to me, and I'll ask it to you is like, what does this say about William's confidence in Logan, like going forward and his seat? I don't know if it says anything yet. Um, I think that right now, like, obviously, Logan knows that he has to put forth a lot this season in order to keep his seat. I haven't really considered, you know, who are, would be the front runners to, to take over for him. Obviously, Kimi Antonelli, who's one of the Mercedes juniors, is probably the top one. Um, I don't know about, you know, Mick Schumacher, because I, you know, he's just hasn't really been spoken about um, at all. But I In this case, it's more of a Alex is performing better right now in the first two races of the season. We need him to, you know, get us as, you know, as close to the points as possible to help us in this midfield battle this season. See, and I, I disagree. I think this is like, we don't have confidence in you because just like, take a step back. Say this is the situation for Aston Martin, Alpine. Are they really like, say it. Fernando's car was totaled. They didn't have another chassis. Are they going to say, hey, Lance, we got to take your car for, you know, Fernando? No, because they, you know, it seems like they have confidence in, like, well, okay, maybe Aston Martin's a bad example because of <laughs> Daddy Stroll. Alpine, right? Say it happens with Gasly. Oh, Gasly and Alcon wouldn't reach each other before, you okay, know. Maybe another poor example. V card. We'll take V card. Right? Well, <laughs> they always favor. Daniel and Yuki's driving a lot better. I'm just saying, if you, like, Charles and Carlos, virtually the same. Yeah. Again, a bad example because they favor Charles. But Charles. <laughs> say, Carlos, this happened to Carlos, like, they're not going to say, hey, Charles, get out of your car. If Checo did it, Checo would be SOL. They wouldn't take the car away from Max. Granted, it's right. Max. But it's this essentially the same. And I don't think they would do that. But maybe the best example is Lewis and George, Right. Say George crash, crashes his car. They're going to say, hey, Lewis, give up your car or vice versa. George, give up your car for Lewis. No, I don't think so. Because I they- think I think they would get I think that they would ask George to give Lewis his car. I don't I don't think they would. I I I think that the, that there's just a little bit more Lewis bias on 
on I mean, on Mercedes. See, the other one I could really see that maybe is a better example because one is consistently scoring points and one is not as V carb. And like if Yuki totaled his car, I could see them asking Danny for his car. Mm. Maybe. There's also a lot of Danny bias. But but what I'm yeah. trying to say, bottom line, is I don't think another team would have made this decision. I think it was a Williams specific because of the situation. I don't know. You, you know, result. you know, you know where where it is is I think that we would see this at Haas. But they both scored but like I think okay, Hulk is scoring one they, point. It's not like he's getting like 10 points a race. But Maybe. if you look historically, Hulk has performed better know. than K Mag. So I do think that if Haas was in this situation, which we could, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we ever saw Haas in this situation because they have no money. I I do think that they would ask Kevin to give up his car for But Kevin's Nico. a different person than Logan. And I don't think Kevin would be okay with it. Because I think Logan... Well, I mean, I don't think he'd be okay. Logan's not okay with it. No, but at the same time, I think he understands it. Where K-Mags is always on the cusp. And so is, you know, uh, Hulk. I don't think they're that far apart. I think Albon and and Logan are um, further apart than K-Mags and Hulk. Yeah, no, I I can agree with you on that. And I think that that Alex has a lot more experience, which is enabling him to completely outdrive the cars that he's been given this season and last season. Um, But I still don't think necessarily that this, you know, speaks to a lack of faith in Logan being able to perform. I don't know. I think it does because it's like, hey, we don't believe that you can score points. We're giving the car to Albon. Like, that's how I'm reading it, though. But at the end of the, I mean, but again... Albon is more experienced. He's been in the, you know, in F1 longer. He has been doing better as of late versus, you know, Logan. So I don't know. But that's, I would not be surprised if we don't see Logan on the grid next year. Oh, no, I I, I agree with you there. I, I definitely, like, his, and his seat is vulnerable. Williams, where is he going to be? You know what I mean? So. Right, exactly. So so that is lots of questions to to be continued Yeah, as we discuss all year long. But back to Australia, and I think there were two other drivers that really, you know, stood out on the who else impressed list. I think that's Yuki and Kevin Magnuson. Yeah, I got, I mean, I got to give it to Yuki. He's been qualifying fairly well. I mean, getting into Q3 in the carbohydrate car, I think is a huge feat. Um, Definitely outscoring and out qualifying Danny, which I think is great for Yuki. But again, like I just said, I think Yuki's going to be stuck in this car forever and never going to mm-hmm. be able to have like a truly good car. I don't think he would ever be considered for like the next Red Bull seat, unfortunately. But no. Yuki is he's out driving that car and he's he got some really good points this weekend. Six, um, yeah. Ultimately, is, it became six, <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing. Um, I think he did great, and yeah, save for K Mags, like. K-Max is kind of following marching orders at this point because they're really favoring Hulk, which is fine. But like I also just said, you know, they're pretty comparable. It's not like they're worlds apart. Um, It's just really how they've been positioned. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think, I think the, where it boils, what it boils down to is Hulk is a better qualifier than K-Max. Correct. Right now, absolutely correct. And I think that, you know, it was nice to see Haas have a double points finish. And it was nice to see RB get on the board. And like six points when you're a bottom tier team, as is both yeah. these teams are right now, but especially RB, that's a lot of points. And it when it comes to the fact that Williams doesn't have any points right now, the, the, the battle for like six, seven, and eight is going to be really tight this year. And then you've got, you know, Sauber and Alpine, Alpine out in the bottom fighting to, you know, stay out of the basement, which, yikes. They have fallen down these stairs to the basement and someone has locked them in and they're not leaving. And they can't yeah. even find the light or find the stairs. Like that, I'm convinced that's where they are. At least Sauber. Yeah. Well, but but what was interesting is I think Sauber was doing almost everything that it could to give Alpine position ahead of them. You know, 18-hour pit stops, 
the the car the car's not great and then you've got alpine on the other side of it who's like no 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 you after you i mean you know pierre gasly <laughs> you got a penalty last, hold my beer <laughs> like honestly it, exactly which you know it's 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 not a good look for for either team but you know sauber needs to figure out what this wheel nut issue is because you know when you've got Ted Kravitz chiming in saying, you know, oh, hey, you know, Sauber didn't have a bad pit stop. And like, we don't even know what their pit stops were because TV stopped showing the durations because they're so bad. Yeah. Ring the bell. Sauber had a pit stop. <laughs> that wasn't 45 so seconds. Yeah. yeah and we no, don't even know what it was. No, that like definitely hits on my list of like disappointments of the weekend. The fact that they can't figure it out on the third race is so unacceptable. Um, obviously, you know, you're going to pit if you're having struggles with getting your wheel nuts off. Let's do something about it. Um, and maybe it's too big of a change that they can't until they really bring more upgrades to the car later on, but they're not going to be competitive if they're going to have 15 second pit stops. Exactly. Yeah. And so for our, who's disappointed for, for this race, it's not drivers, actually it's Car parts. Um, <laughs> All it, the car parts. It's it's pretty much car parts. It's the wheel nuts at Sauber. It's Lewis Hamilton's power unit. It was Max's right rear brake. Um, the visor tear off that got caught in Esteban Ocon's brake duct. Um, and then yes, it was the Alpine drivers because they just you know. How can Gasly, Gasly got lucky that his penalty. Billing. How can yeah. he not leave the pit? Like that is the for penalty. what he already got reprimanded for. I know it's like follow the white line all you yeah. gotta do it's that one is stupid but whatever yeah and and he you speaking know he got reprimanded stupid. oh yeah speaking of stupid we're gonna have to talk about this for for a second alonzo's post-race penalty of 20 seconds i don't like this i and three points don't on his like license that. which seems excessive a that seems excessive but b i don't think it actually means anything because if you think about going back to when pierre gasly was the most penalized driver of all time um and he was like on the verge of a race ban and everybody was like is he gonna get banned from a race and then all of a sudden he stopped getting penalty points obviously he also stopped getting penalties and stopped crashing because he was in a different car but i i don't have confidence in fia's the fia's ability to you know, penalize and monitor penalty points and actually give the penalties that they say that they're going to give. And, you know, Fernando has three points. I think he only has three points. Yeah, so he only has three. And they fine. reset like in May or something, or they drop off like in a weird time of the year because it's not fiscal. No, it's, it's, like it's based off it's i think it's like based off like a year to the race that you achieved, that you got the points in right yeah 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 okay yeah yeah but like yeah. okay and i was reading the FIA and the stewards like notes and the printout that they publish and i wildly disagree with everything that they said Agreed. it was like you know the driver had never done this in any other point in the race so like clearly he's lying and he was doing this deliberately Obviously, I'm paraphrasing, but clearly he was fighting for a position for the first time the entire race. So, yeah, maybe he's going to drive a little bit differently and have a little bit of a different strategy. Like, don't look at, you know, lap 22 where nothing's happening. Clearly, that's not going to be the same. He's not going to take the same line or the same approach as he is in the very last lap of the race where he's trying to win. Well, yeah, but Not he's also going to be like trying to make get points. But he's also going to be managing his car differently from lap twenty to lap fifty eight, which is you know the and and they they. They said, you know, he's not at fault for creating dirty air behind his car, um, but he slowed down to an excessive point that was not expected by the driver behind, which was George, who ended he crashed um, and ended up he clipped a wall and ended up, you know, on his side in the middle of the track. It was a little, little scary until you know he got out. But I do think that Alonso's penalty was both excessive and unnecessary yeah. um you know there there are the rules of of moving under braking which you can't you can move once under braking you cannot move more than once um but i do really think that you know the stewards really went after fernando for something that you know well, they shouldn't have 
It's a scary precedent to set, too, right? Like, yeah. Oh, they slowed down more than the driver behind them was anticipating. It's like, you don't, you don't know what the car in front of you is actually going to do. And so what if, like, I can just imagine the radio calls. Like, well, they slowed down a little bit more than I was anticipating. And then I did something bad, so it's their fault. Yeah. It's it's such a George thing. Like, of course. Yeah, it's it, unfortunately this is not the first time George has done this while in active no. pursuit. This happened right. in Singapore last year. I have not watched Silverstone 2022 when he also crashed in a Carlos Sainz win because I just won't watch that race for reasons. But this, you know, George is a good driver. I know that you don't, you know, he's not your favorite, but he's a very solid driver. And, but he still has these quirks, especially when he's trying really hard to overtake the car in front of him, that sometimes he loses a little bit of that awareness and that leads him into a wall. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Also off track for a moment. I feel like, (laughs) Catherine would watch Silverstone 2022 as the ultimate cliffhanger of this podcast. <laughs> yes, yes, Will I we know. ever find out? Keep listening to no. <laughs> the answer is no. Is no. But, but keep listening anyways. Keep listening, and I will still reference to the fact that I will not watch that race for oh. reasons. Um, oh my gosh. Anyway, I saw enough of it on Drive to Survive because they showed that clip of Joe Guan Yu flipping over 82 times. From a million know, angles. From a you million angles. Just of it. Yeah, but also, you know, back before we leave George real quick, do you, you know, let's talk about the question that other people have been asking, you know, should the Australian Grand Prix have been red flagged after George's crash? So after further, you know, consideration, <laughs> um, if it was not the last lap of the race, yes, because it was the last lap of the race, no, because you brought up a really good point and I'm using it as my personal Point now as well but you're welcome you pointed this out that the cars would have had to take the same path whether it was red flagged or not because they had to pass him at some point like they can't just hold up the entire race for george's car so they would have had to pass him to go to the pit lane because it's the last lap there's no difference so like if it was not the last lap, then absolutely it should have been red flag. But I feel like they would have done that if it was not the last lap. Right. Yeah. And obviously we had a very contentious last lap red flag last year. Um, but these are two totally different situations. And obviously we've heard George's radio call and we've heard George calling for a red flag. George was absolutely right to ask for a red flag because he had just crashed his car. He didn't know where he landed and he was on his side. So you know, based on prior experience, prior crashes, George is 100% in the right to ask for a red flag. Does the fact that it wasn't red flagged mean that that was the wrong decision or that George was wrong? No to either question. It was just, you know, a, you know, VSC or a red flag ultimately brought up the same result of bringing the cars back to the pit lane for the end of the race. Yeah. I I mean, I I understand what you're saying from his perspective, but at the same time, to me, it's just like George complaining on the radio again. I mean, also that. (laughs) This is the guy who also called his car a rocket ship, and then it was a rocket ship just straight into a wall. Um, And he was projected for a podium finish, so... I mean, yeah, he's yeah. always projected to a to a podium <laughs> finish. Yeah, it was it was a really rough weekend for Mercedes. Like, yeah, to, they had a flat out. out. It was just yeah, and I loved how like George crashed. No, I don't love that George crashed. I I found it amusing how they show coverage and it was like George's crash, and then they pan to Lewis Hamilton and yeah. he's just sitting there like in his street clothes, like son of a bitch. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yeah, but. Because this this dinged them, and we'll talk about where the constructor standings are in a minute, but this did ding them pretty badly. And, you know, Fernando's, um, his post-race penalty actually helped them in the standings. But Mercedes is having a rough one right now. Yeah, should we get into the constructor's update? Yeah, let's do that. So I was putting together the rundown, and I was like, oh, um, we should probably talk about where the drivers stand and where the teams stand in the drivers and constructor standings, because obviously in light of Max's DNF, things are a lot closer than they have been for, what, a year? They'll be close for a, a week, and then, you know. I mean, yes, but 
still um on the driver's side max is still ahead he's got 51 points because he did you know max out one race and then you know got 25 points in the other one charles leclerc has bumped up to p2 he's got 47 points he's one point ahead of sergio perez carlos Sainz has bumped himself up to um positions he's in p4 with 40 points after his pretty decent day if you if you think about it um and then oscar piastri is currently in p5 with 28 points that's one that i'm excited to watch is oscar. yeah i hope that you know mclaren can figure out the team orders between him and norris and just whoever's having the better race gets the better position yeah um but it's a lot closer than last year and I love that, you know, Carlos is only six and seven points behind two people when he didn't race an entire race. So exactly. Go to and then the, the other part of the driver standings that I'm really in, excited to, to watch is how long it takes for Ollie Behrman to just like keep moving down because he moved from, I think, P10 to P12 this week. Right. Yep. But I still like think it's going to be a while before I, I don't think he's going to end up being the last driver in the constructor standings. No. Well, Logan's not going to get a point, and I highly doubt that the Alpines are going to get a point. So he will at least finish P, what, 18? It, it could be something like like that, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, he alone has more points than Haas. That is true, yes. So Haas has four points. They are yeah. on the board. So looking they at are... constructors, obviously Red Bull is in first with 97 points. But Ferrari's only behind by four. Yeah. Which this time last year, that's not how close it was. So um, that's exciting. But then there's a little bit of a jump to McLaren with 55 points. Mercedes has 26. They did have a double DNF this weekend, which is, you know, brutal for their standing. Yeah. Um, Aston Martin is one point behind with 25. And then we really jump again to Carbohydrate with six points and Haas with four and then you know Sauber and um Alpine Alpine yeah though that said Aston Martin would have been ahead of Mercedes had Fernando got not gotten that penalty so that that did flip overnight for us in the United States um but yeah it was it's it's going to be a really interesting midfield battle um, Mercedes has some work to do McLaren you know, I, I said in, in our, our season predictions, McLaren could, you know, jump some teams that it might not be expected to jump this year. Obviously, well, honestly, it's early. It's race three, but. Yeah, I would, I mean, between Ferrari, McLaren, Mercedes, Aston Martin, who knows where the rest of the season could take those four teams. Like, I, I truly think Red Bull is going to pull away and win constructors again this year. Just because Ferrari is doing well right now doesn't mean anything because Charles and Carlos are Charles and Carlos and their strategy team, like, to you know burn the world down so who knows where ferrari will end up but i think those yeah. four teams it'll be interesting to watch oh extremely and then speaking of haas real quick obviously we want to uh, recognize that ayo Komatsu as team principal has had a really nice two races first with his first points as team principal and now with his first double points as team principal but going back to Last year's team principal, it was really fun to have Gunther Steiner, you know, back in the paddock. Obviously, he's, um, he's, I mean, it's, it's a thing. Um, He's, he's doing commentary for a German TV outlet this season, but he also did the post-race interviews after Australia. And that was, I'm going to say he attempted (laughs) because there, it was hard for, well, at least Charles to understand hear. what he was saying and hear him. Also, it could have been really loud. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there were there was it was a little rough. I would say I liked seeing him, but um, I'd honestly love to hear him and like Crofty and Ted Kravitz and Martin Brundle all do a um, telecast together. Oh my god, that would be fun. But I don't know if I need him like asking post race questions. Yeah, was was it the 
was it a little awkward? Yes. But also, you know, one of the things that kind of surprised me a little bit when I got into to Formula One in 2021 was as somebody with a journalism background and as somebody who does have experience in interviewing athletes, I was surprised at some of the questions that I would hear, you know, when you go to some races who bring in like local talent yeah. who don't really know how to ask questions. So in the grand scheme of was were, were Gunther's questions the worst I'd ever heard? No. Not even remotely. No. Um, would I like to see Gunther back on the grid asking, you know, post race interview questions over some other talent that, you know, they may choose? Absolutely. Was it the best? No. That's a fair assessment. That's fair. I agree. Yeah. But do we love having Gunther back on our televisions? Also, yes. Obviously. Well, and I think he's coming back to Drive to Survive next year, too. I oh, I hope so. That would be so. that would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's uh, the most depressing part of the podcast where I talked about how terribly wrong I was. I would also like I was to also... acknowledge, though, that this was pre us knowing Carlos was going to race. And just, you know, based on the fact that he had his appendix out and major abdom abdominal surgery 16 days before the race, we were leaning on the side of caution of he wasn't going to race or if he would, he would not have a stellar performance. Wow. Were we wrong? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So our predictions for pole, Max obviously got pole, um, third race in a row, and Catherine chose Max. I chose Charles, which Oops. I felt like was a a good one up until It wasn't bad. Carlos, up until I knew Carlos was racing, and then I was like, oh, okay. Which is fine. Um yeah. and our podiums were just completely Yeah wrong. So Carlos Charles Lando was the podium. Catherine had Max Checo Oscar. I had Max Charles Checo. Yeah. Um, so I got one in the right position. You did. But that's it. Um, and we don't get points for that. So go team. <laughs> Moving into P10, the hardest one to choose. Um, you chose Daniel. I had Lewis. When I saw him qualify, I was like, oh, he's P11? Like, right. I could be on to something here. And then he DNF'd. So, yeah. There was that. I think if, without the DNF, I think there was every opportunity that he, he ended up in the realm of P10. Oh, 100%. But it ended up being K Mags, which is fine. Yep. So, for our current standings of predictions, you are at 11 points. I'm at two points. But I feel like this could, this is going to flip flop constantly throughout the season. Oh, yeah. And, I might be able to come back. If not, that's fine. But yeah, I mean, obviously we have, we have a sprint race coming up, which uh, unfortunately oh. for the fact that it's a sprint race, but it also means more picks and more points. Oh, more opportunities for disappointment for Emily, but that's okay. But I could be wrong too. Oh, and then moving into our biggest surprise of the weekend, Catherine said that it was going to be a good weekend for, um, V carb. V -carb. Like, I'm just, I'm so dead set on carbohydrate. I just forget, like, what their actual team name is. And when I want to, like, actually say it, I can't ever remember. But uh, good weekend for V-Carb. It actually was. Yuki did score points. He finished P7. Daniel struggled, but he did do well for where he was at from qualifying. I will yeah, I, I would say from, from a race perspective, not thinking about qualifying, which I know you have to think about qualifying, but considering the way qualifying played out with his time getting deleted. And so he didn't get out of Q1. Um, he did what he was expected to do when he finished ahead of who, he, who was expected to finish. Obviously, that's like very little consolation in the grand scheme of where everyone wants to see Daniel Ricciardo perform. But for the case of this race and where he, he needed to be, he did what he, he should have. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I had like a double pronged surprise. I said, if Ollie's racing, he will get points. If he's not racing, we're going to have a clean race. Ha ha. And no, no. <laughs> wrong. Should never, ever think that for Australia, but I guess that's why it would be a surprise. So yeah. All right. And then who's going to do a dumb? You said Mercedes is going to be on the struggle bus. And they were. I'd say a double DNF qualifies. Yep. Um, I said, Daniel Ricardo is not going to have a good weekend, too much pressure in front of his home crowd. I feel like I get credit for this one just because he did not do well in qualifying. Um, oh, yeah, half credit at least. Which, which partial credit. Um, <laughs> thanks, teacher. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll give myself a pat on the back for that one, unfortunately. Yeah. But 
you know, all in all, solid race weekend. I think I, te- or I didn't text you because we don't text, but I think I DM'd you that, you know, overall, this was a good, solid, like, racing weekend. Like, we saw fighting, we saw overtakes, we saw, you know, action. It was a good, true race. So I'm very happy. 100%. Yeah, this was... After, you know, obviously I love to see Red Bulls dominate, like don't get me wrong, but this was also a really great race. And it is fun sometimes to see what happens when Max isn't in the mix. I can admit that even as the Red Bull fan. You're so brave. I know. I'm so brave about this. (laughs) I know. And I just, I'm so happy for Carlos and so happy. I just, I'm so excited to see where he ends up. Like, I think he's setting himself up so good for next year, which we've been talking about and calling this for you know months now about how this is going to be his best season yet um i'm very excited to see the the rest of the season for carlos yeah 100 percent, absolutely oh well looking forward into the future in two weeks we'll be racing in japan in the spring yes. what is this i love i'm very excited it'll be interesting yeah, yeah. We, um so again taking a step back emily's key phrase um the schedule has changed this year to be more geographically friendly um so we're not you know ping-ponging across the world constantly throughout the season so suzuka is in the spring this year versus the fall it'll be a little bit different i'm very excited yeah i'm one of the the things that i know you know suzuka really prided itself on you know for for a great many years was the fact that a lot of world champions are crowned at this race so it, it's really yeah. interesting for me that they actually agreed to move into the you know to the schedule like that they agreed to that in their contract um negotiations but yeah i i'm really excited to see what this is gonna bring i think max is gonna come out and want to be like hey don't you get excited world, um, which as the Red Bull fan, I'm excited for, but I, I, I love Suzuka. I'm really excited about this race. The fans at Suzuka are some of the best in the world. Um, so this is, it's going to be a really, it's going to be a really fun race. I'm pumped. Yeah. Yeah. So coming up next for the podcast, we will have our Japan Grand Prix predictions coming out the Thursday before race weekend. Yes. But that's been the podcast for Australia. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.